I have observed this rule in uh, all cases. Interest in the growth and development of this very fine college. The invocation this morning will be offered by David D. Lingard, President, Granger East LDS State. President Lingard. <coughs> Our Father in heaven, we unite here this day in this wonderful building to give thanks unto thee for thy bounties and thy blessings. And we are particularly grateful, Father, for this edifice and for this institution that fills such a key and important role in our community. We are grateful unto thee for thy divine influence in bringing this campus to this point, and we are grateful for the diligent effort that has been put into the development of this place by those key individuals who have felt the need for this kind of facility in our community. We are grateful, Father, that <clears throat> we have experienced thy many blessings, and we give thanks unto thee for life and for this great country and the freedom that we enjoy. And we ask that thou wilt continue to bless our leaders in this country, particularly at this critical time when peace negotiations are taking place, that the leaders of the world who are involved might have their hearts touched and that agreements might be reached which will uh, enable the people of this world to remain free and to avoid war. How we ask, Father, this day as we meet here to dedicate this building that thy spirit will be with us and that the participants on this program might feel thy divine guidance in what they say and what transpires this day. And we ask thee also, Father, to bless those who will participate in this building during its life that they might also feel thy divine spirit and guidance in all that they do. And these blessings we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the governing boards, the advisory council, the students, the faculty, and the staff at Utah Technical College, we certainly welcome you to the dedication ceremonies for this new technology building. It's a great honor and a privilege for me this morning to introduce to you the distinguished platform guests. We would appreciate the guests standing as their names are called and remain standing until all have been introduced. And if you will, please, would you kindly hold your applause until such time as they have all been presented to you. <clears throat> On my left, your right, Dr. J.J. Campbell, the Deputy Superintendent Office of Administration and Services from the State Department of Education. Dr. Leon R. McCary, Associate Commissioner, Utah System of Higher Education. Mr. Glenn R. Swinson, Director, Utah State Building Board. Dr. Elroy Nelson, <coughs> Chairman, Utah State Building Board. Senator Warren E. Pugh, President of the Salt Lake Area Chamber of Commerce. Mrs. Helen B. Yore, the Chairman of the State Board for Vocational Education. Elder Robert L. Simpson, Assistant to the Twelve, LDS Church and member of the College Advisory Council. President David D. Lingard, President of the Granger East LDS Stake. Mr. Horace J. Gunn, Chairman of the Utah Technical College Advisory Council. Mr. Keith Richardson, Architect, Richardson, Richardson and Associates. William A. Richardson, architect, Richardson, Richardson and Associates. Mr. Herman Paulson, the general contractor, Paulson Construction Company. Mr. Howard B. Paulson, the superintendent of the project, Paulson Construction Company. And Mr. Joseph S. Johnson, superintendent of buildings and grounds at Utah Technical College. Now, if you care to express your appreciation. Thank you. 
Utah Technical College is celebrating its 25th year. Yes, sir. For 25 years, we've been waving the vocational education banner in the great state of Utah. We started this college by fighting for survival under one of Utah's most colorful governors, also a former mayor of Salt Lake City, J. Bracken Lee. Now, if you'll open your memory books to page 1949, you'll recall that he vetoed the appropriation for this institution. And although we didn't live the life of Riley during the eight years of his administration, we did manage to survive. Last spring, I was attending a breakfast meeting at the Hotel Utah. And seated in the table, reasonably close to where I was seated, was Mayor J. Bracken Lee and Mrs. Lee. <clears throat> I was both pleased and surprised, frankly, to have the mayor approach the table where I was seated and say, good morning, President Nelson. After a short exchange of greetings, he said to me, <clears throat> President, I want to congratulate you on the development of your new campus. And then, as he departed to go back to his table, he grabbed my hand and he said, you know, you've succeeded in spite of me, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was quite an admission. Well, when I was a young man <clears throat> in college, we used to define education as the process of forcing abstract ideas into concrete blocks. I became somewhat fascinated with vocational education because in the field of vocational education, we learn by doing and forcing isn't necessary. Vocational education, Americans' education's afterthought. You know, today, vocational education is steamrolling its way into prominence over the time-honored, oversold concept that the first stop on the road to success is a four-year college degree. You know, for more than two decades, <clears throat> we have been advocating here on this campus that the first stop on the road to success is the acquisition of a saleable skill. And we have incessantly preached this doctrine that all work is honorable and that the ability to earn a respectable living is a primary requisite of citizenship. Although vocational education is only a part of the <clears throat> new career education concept, we feel that it's a very integral part. And we're highly supportive of the concept. Career education, as you know, is designed to instill within the student a desire to work and familiarize the student with the career options available to him. And we're thrilled that this orientation and indoctrination is scheduled to begin in the elementary grades. Well, from my point of view, education fails unless the three R's at the one end of the spectrum lead ultimately to the three S's at the other end of the spectrum. And those three S's, from my point of view, are number one, preparation for earning a living. Number two, preparation for citizenship. And number three, preparation for participation in the problems involved in making a better world. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, I think it would be amiss if I didn't give you just a few very brief highlights concerning the development of this wonderful campus. A 78-acre site was purchased in 1959 for $200,000. An additional 25 acres was purchased in 1969 for $225,000. The heating plant was completed in 1964. The administration building was completed in March of 1967. The Metal Trades Building was completed in July of 1967, and the Auto Trades Building was completed in January of 1968. Added adjacent to the campus in 1969 was the Institute of Religion. 
It was in the summer of 1969 when Governor Rampton met with the newly formulated State Board of Higher Education and the Institutional Council from the nine post high schools in the state of Utah. And in his speech, among other things, I recall that he said, there will only be this next year approximately six million dollars for building funds in the state of Utah. And it's my recommendation, he said, that a sizable amount of that money be appropriated to Utah Technical College for the appropriation of a technology building. Well, the money was appro appropriated. <clears throat> and it was in 1971, on a beautiful day, even warmer than it is outside today, when we held the groundbreaking exercises for this particular building. And our governor was here participating and I remember that he operated a piece of diesel equipment as the feature of the groundbreaking exercises. <clears throat> well, I would say that his influence has assisted in channeling Utah's educational programs toward more realistic, more practical, and more job-oriented goals. And this building, I would say, probably would not be in existence today if it were not for the assistance of Governor Rampton. Well, subsequent legislatures have appropriated additional monies to the college for our buildings. <clears throat> we were appropriated a sum of money to plan a construction trades and maintenance building, which is, has, uh, the plans have been prepared. The building is on the state building board list. However, there are a number of other institutions and other state departments ahead of us, and it would be necessary for the state of Utah to appropriate approximately $20 million prior to the time that we would have an appropriation made for the construction trades and technology building. And consequently, it's my guesstimation that it will be 1974 before we receive any additional construction monies. The building that's going up immediately to the west of the technology building here is the College Center, our student union building. And we're delighted that this building will be completed and in use at least a year from now. Well, where do we go from here? <clears throat> Only time will tell, I suppose. But our projections certainly include <clears throat> a heavy-duty mechanics building. There is a critical need for a building in this particular area. Certainly, we need on this campus a physical education building. And we need on this campus, although this is a beautiful auditorium, it's much too small to accommodate the 4,400 students who are enrolled at this college. Well, this activity this morning marks the culmination of a dream of many, many years by many individuals. And on behalf of the entire college, I'd like to pay tribute this morning to those dedicated individuals, organizations, and agencies who have provided the encouragement and the assistance which has made this occasion possible. We're very, very deeply grateful. And hopefully, without missing anybody, I would like to recognize a few of those great numbers who have helped. First, recognition and support should be expressed to the State Board of Education and the State Board of Higher Education the College Advisory Council, the advisory committees here at the college, the Utah State Building Board, the staff of the Utah State Building Board, and certainly the dedicated staff and employees here at Utah Technical College. And Senator Pugh, we're grateful for the legislative support which has been given to this college. And we commend the architects, Richardson and Richardson, for their abilities and their attention to the project and for their cooperation, and certainly we are, should not forget the great assistance that's been given to us by Jerry Anderson, the associate in that particular firm. <clears throat> we acknowledge certainly the efforts of our general contractor, Paulson Construction Company. They've been tremendous to work with. I'd certainly like to extend a special plaudit to Howard Paulson, whom we call Huck, the superintendent of construction on this building. Huck is a great craftsman, knows most of the areas, but nobody is infallible, and I wasn't surprised the other day when Huck told me of a mistake that uh, we almost made on this building. When we originally started it, Huck had it planned 
that it was going to be moved 50 feet to the south. Now, had that occurred, you people on the back row would probably be sitting on the stage here this morning. But fortunately, Huck had lots of people to assist him, and that error was determined and found. Certainly, we appreciate the, the uh, assistance of the state inspectors. Eldon Harding, the project uh, inspector on this project, and Wilson Harris, the chief inspector for the Utah State Building Board. And I'd like to also, at this particular time, I don't get an opportunity very often to express my appreciation for the abilities, dedication, and support of my colleague, Mr. Joseph S. Johnson, who is the superintendent of buildings and grounds here at Utah Technical College. <clears throat> and last, but far from least, we should cheerfully acknowledge this morning the price paid by one workman on this building. He gave his life on this project. He was working on a scaffold several feet above the ground, fell, and died in a hospital several weeks later. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without speaking longer, I would like to <clears throat> say to you that as a college, we recognize and accept the tremendous challenge that is ours to provide trade, technical, and business education to the citizens of this great state of Utah. We pledge our efforts and our support to the industrialization of Utah and to keep pace with the challenges and the innovations which will be brought about and are brought about daily by modern technology. And I would like to assure each and every one of you here this morning that our efforts and energies will be expended <clears throat> primarily to meet our objective which is fundamentally to prepare people for employment in the world of work. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to introduce a, a gentleman to you uh, who has the name of Nelson. I suppose Dr. Nelson, if they haven't gone down the program, they'll think they have to be named Nelson to get on this program this morning. <laughs> but we're delighted that you are here. And I would just like to say that uh, Dr. Nelson is a very dedicated individual. He's an economist, a professor, the chairman of the State Building Board, and has been for many years. I would also like to tell you that he was a member of the site committee that selected this campus for Utah Technical College. I will never forget it, I'm sure, because about in the area where the, the uh, administration building now sits, there was an old log cabin and I remember uh, Dr. Nelson making quite a point of the fact that this old log cabin would make a beautiful home for the president. <laughs> well, Dr. Nelson, we got rid of that beautiful president's home, and uh, we don't have another president's home on campus, and we probably won't have one during my reign here at Utah Technical College, but we do want you to know that we appreciate what you have done for this institution and the great leadership that you're providing for the building program in the state of Utah. I present to you, then, Dr. Elroy Nelson. Thank you, Jay. Your name happens to be the name of a grandnephew of mine, but I must assure the audience, Jay Nelson here is not my grandson. <laughs> there are a few other stories that might be told, but there are a few omissions. Technically, this building does not yet belong to the Utah Trade Tech. Uh, we've forgotten as a building board to give it to you. May I present it today in effect, Jay? Be glad to accept it. <laughs> we won't bother with too much of that kind of formality, of course. But giving a little credit to the promotional schemes of a lot of people and the real dedication of many advisory council people, we might remind ourselves of a little of that history. The legislature has provided $9,455,124 for the purchase of land and the construction of buildings to this date. This does not include, of course, the construction of the student union, which is paid for by student funds and, of course, supported in background by uh, a bond issue for which the students have pledged themselves as student body to pay for that building, which is so badly needed. While the legislature's appropriated this figure I just gave you a minute ago, 
the amount expended is $9,340,247.33. I can't find that 33 cents. Do you know where it went? My secretary will tell me. All right. At any rate, let's consider the building formally a part of the Trade Tech, Utah Trade uh, Campus. May I correct the president? He's relatively young and his memory is not so good as it might be. The legislature and the governor, Governor Clyde, providing for the new campus gave an assignment to the State Board of Education as well as the building board. Said you have to agree and have a majority agreement on the part of both of those boards to select the campus. Believe it or not, we scouted all of Salt Lake County and actually went up the line a little ways in Davis County. Uh, we needed part of that Davis County place as a place to put a salt work, so we eliminated that. We found out some housing were being, houses were being built on other areas which we wanted. Finally arrived at the sugar beet fields and hay fields to choose the best irrigated area in Salt Lake County for the location would have quality land to begin with. The actual decision was made at a meeting of those two boards, not at this pioneer memorial house for the president, but right in the middle of a beet field. The decision was made, this is the land we will purchase. This will provide enough on the exterior, and it has at least about 100 acres for this dedication. Incidentally, we could not maintain that log house. We found out that Jay did not come with the pioneers of 1847, was therefore <laughs> ineligible. <laughs> I do have a pup tent I'm willing to donate. My kids don't need it any longer. <laughs> At any rate, this was the first major job handed the building board after it was organized in its present form in 1957. That seems an awfully long ways away. Well, it's quite a few buildings away and quite a few students and an excellent faculty has been accumulated, acquired since that particular time. We recognize, of course, the tremendous impact this college has at the, to date and will have in the future on the technical training, the excellent education provided, those who have a big part to play in the development of the state, the area, the industries, today and tomorrow. We're proud of the institution. We're proud of what it is offering today. We're proud of what it promises tomorrow. And as a pattern, we probably will follow with appropriations from the legislature and recommendations from the governor, a program for a similar institution, the Trade Tech at Provo, which is now in the particular stage that this institution was 15 years ago, with this exception. The institution at Provo has relatively new buildings, but on a very small campus. The property has been purchased, authorization by the legislature, six years ago. We start a pattern there, and the pattern there, uh, pattern that has been established here will be very important in the development of a second major trade tech institution to match the demands of the students, of the community, and of course, the state entirely. We appreciate the excellent work of the people here. We appreciate the work of the architects for this and the preceding buildings, and the architects who are now working in the planning stages on the next building, construction, trades, and maintenance. To be determined by the amount of money available by the legislature will be the time we might start the next building on the campus. No one can give an answer today, not even the president, the new president of the state senate. But I know very well he's working on that. We appreciate all of these things for the further development, economy, manpower, of the state of Utah. Thank you very much. We'll now be favored by musical selections from a 
Sextet from the Tabernacle Choir. We certainly appreciate that beautiful music. One of the things we miss on our own campus is the opportunity to teach this type of education. 
Now, at this particular time, I'm going to ask Dr. Campbell, if he will, to operate the electronic gadget near his seat. And as he does this, we will be introduced to modern technology. Dr. Campbell, if you would please. All right, let's try it again, Dr. Campbell. Zero. <laughs> I think what we need is an electronic technician. <laughs> Well, you see, we need more technicians, not so many PhDs. <laughs> well, I can see the headlines tomorrow. <laughs> At any rate, before we conclude today, who knows, maybe it will work. Will you go back and look over with your board the list of priorities on buildings and put that electrical appliance on the building. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nelson. <laughs> we, we'll underline that one. Well, at this particular time, it's my real pleasure to introduce to you the president of the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce, Senator Warren Pugh. And Warren, we're thrilled to tell this audience, in case they don't already know, that day before yesterday, Senator Pugh was elected as president of the Senate for the next legislative session. Congratulations. <laughs> what happened here just a moment ago reminded me of a conversation I had uh, some few weeks ago with, with one of uh, my customers who happens to, to uh, operate some very sophisticated equipment, uh, uh, trucking equipment, uh, in, a, in a very difficult location. They, uh, we were talking about the use of, uh, uh, turbo, of, of turbine, gas turbine engines versus diesel engines. And he made the remark that uh, the problem with the turbine engine at this point was that it was so highly sophisticated that uh, it took a PhD to operate the truck. And I told him that I thought that wasn't too bad because there were more PhDs out of work than there were truck drivers. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, I sat on the stand here this morning, Dr. Elroy Nelson whispered in my ear and said, uh, can you remember which hat you're supposed to be wearing? And uh, I said to him, well, it really doesn't make any difference because I find no conflict in my mind between the various hats that I have to wear on occasion. I am a businessman who, in effect, uh, needs this kind of an institution uh, for, for future employees. And uh, my experience in the Senate is uh, also one that leads me to believe that this is a much needed facility in our community and as uh, President of the Chamber of Commerce, also, uh, I feel the same way. Uh, I would like to, just by way of introduction, if I may, read to you a resolution which was passed 
at the last uh, Board of Governors meeting of the Chamber of Commerce, which I think is appropriate to this occasion. I won't read all of it, but I'll just uh, read the parts which I think would be of interest to you at this time. It starts out by saying, problem. Utah's educational system has a great many merits to its credit, both in terms of quality and quantity. However, within the framework of Utah's employment picture as related to the educational system output, changes are needed. <clears throat> During 1971, there was an average of 28,300 people unemployed in the state of Utah, 6.3% of the entire labor force. Of this group, 14,500 were young people ages 16 to 24 years of age, 51% of the unemployed, and yet there were approximately 5,000 job openings at any one time during the year, many of which might have been filled by these young people if they had been trained to meet the required job skills. <clears throat> In 1971, it was estimated that only 14.1% of those people employed in Utah required a four-year degree or more. 18.2% of the jobs required one to three years beyond high school. 64.8% required a high school education or less, and 28 were unclassified. These are statistics from the Utah Department of Employment Security. Uh, then there's a little more which I won't read in the interest of time. But the solution which was proposed and which was accepted by the, by the Board of Governors is as follows. Number one, we endorse the concept of career education. By definition, career education can provide for every student leaving school the skills necessary to give him a start in making a livelihood for himself and his family. Career education encompasses a balance of both academic and vocational technical education from kin kindergarten through adulthood. Number two, <clears throat> supports the position made by both the Utah State Board of Education and the State Advisory Council for Vocational and Technical Education on Career and Vocational Education. Among the recommendations by these groups are that the state legislature and boards of education review and increase the total funding for secondary and post-secondary vocational education to more nearly relate, relate education with job opportunities. They also are in the process of implementing career education by introducing to grades K-6, kindergarten through six, the World, Book, the World of Work Attitudes and Awareness Program, to grades seven through 11, career orientation and exploration, and to grades 12 and beyond for career specialization and support programs. Number three, we will support adequate funding of vocational technical education programs and facilities by the state legislature. Number four, we'll participate in a promotional program cooperatively with the Salt Lake Ad Club, both the National and the Utah State Advisory Council for Vocational Education, in an effort to upgrade the image of careers within the skills and trades. It will be aimed at parents, students, and school administrators. Number five, <clears throat> will encourage chamber member businesses to make available on-site tours and, where possible, actual work experience to students seeking vocationally oriented careers. The chamber will also encourage members to offer educators temporary, em temporary employment so that they may receive actual work experiences in their teaching area of specialization. Number six, we'll encourage chamber member businesses to award business, trade, and technical school scholarships for deserving students. Number seven, we'll encourage the chamber members to become actively involved in educational committees already formed at the local educational agencies, the district institutional level, so that their influence may be felt. And number eight, we'll make an effort to educate the entire community as to the advantages of the free enterprise system and the necessity of preserving the system to maintain our way of life. <clears throat> now, if uh, you'll permit me, I would like, uh, in the few minutes that are allotted to me, to be just a little bit personal because I feel that I can communicate that way better to you how I feel about this institution and the programs which it offers. A number of years ago, and I won't dare tell you how many, uh, I was starting out on my business career. 
I soon recognized that I had need for additional training. Uh, circumstance, this was during the Depression years, and circumstances were somewhat different then than they are now. And the opportunity for, for uh, going to school was a little bit more limited. I was married and had a family to support, but I recognized that I was lacking in some, in some training areas. So my first approach to this problem was to go to the University of Utah and ask for admission to the school on, on, a, on a somewhat uh, altered basis than uh, regular students. I told them that I didn't have the time to attend all of the classes or to take all of the subject matter that was normally required for graduation. And, uh, but I was willing to pay the normal fee as long as I could work part-time and, uh, well, in fact, I had to work full-time, go to school part-time. And uh, if they would permit me to take the subjects that I knew that I needed to round out my requirements. Uh, I was told that I couldn't do that, that the rules were such that if I went there, I'd, I had to take the prescribed course. And uh, so I elected not to go. Uh, it was, would have been impossible for me to have done it in that manner. Now, I'm not being critical of the university. I'm only, I'm only citing this illustration to indicate a somewhat change of attitude over the period of years. Uh, my only alternative then was to, to take some extension work and, and go to business college, which I did over a rather long extended period of time. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. But during that period of time, the attitude of university people and the attitudes of the public in general, I believe, have changed for the better. So that now it is possible for young people with, the, with circumstances such as mine who need to find the, uh, the skills that are necessary to advance them in their work or to make them available for entry skills are now being provided. And I think as uh, Dr. J. Nelson has so uh, well expressed today that that is the fundamental, uh, fundamental purpose of this institution is to provide that kind of opportunity for those who want it. Now, I, I hope I will not be misunderstood. In no way am I attempting to criticize our higher institutions of learning because they do provide for us a, a need which is great and which uh, will be continuing, as so I'm sure, for as long as any of us are around. Uh, certainly in certain areas, uh, there is no substitute for that kind of education. There are, there are highly technical areas that require complete uh, four-year and even beyond courses. And I have great admiration for those who have had the fortitude and the ability to, uh, to get the PhD. And all you PhDs over here, <laughs> I, I, I do salute you and, and appreciate the contribution that you're making. Now, one other uh, short Quick illustration to show what I think is a changing attitude and a difference uh, in, in the direction that the educational system is taking. When I first uh, uh, went into the Senate, we had an, we had an occasion at which uh, <clears throat> the matter of vocational education was, was uh, introduced to us as new legislators by a person who had uh, responsibility for vocational education on the university level, not, to, not at the technical college level, but on the university level. And uh, he made a statement which, uh, which very much irritated me at the time, and I took occasion afterwards to talk to him about it. And his statement was that he thought we needed more money for vocational education to take care of those people who didn't have the mental capacity to go through the academic program. And of course, this uh, just really uh, blew me up. And afterwards, I walked up to him and said, I want you to understand that I'm a businessman and I've got 75 mechanics in my place of business and I don't want any stupid mechanics in my business. And I think that attitude has to change. The fact that people prefer to 
work with their hands and their brains and, and do that kind of vocational type of work doesn't in any mean, in any degree, indicate a lessened amount of mental capacity. And in fact, I think it, it takes a special type of mental capacity to do those kinds of things. And I salute those of you who are in this institution and who will be in the future because I believe you are making a great contribution to our future as a community. Now, <clears throat> as a businessman, and I, I think I can speak pretty much for the business community in this regard, we are looking for bright young people who are willing to acquire skills by study and hard work that will prepare them for careers in the vocational field. In our own particular organization, we have now made it a standard practice when we introduce people into our business in the mechanical field, at least, that those, those people who enter the field come either from this college or from Weber State College or from the Technical College in Provo. That's where we start them, or where, we, where we expect to get our future recruits. And in the process of doing so, we give them credit on, in our apprentice program for the time that they have spent in college. It varies somewhat between individuals. But this is our, our approach to our problems. Now, in closing, I would like to, uh, for the benefit of the many students who are here this morning, I'd just like to say this. There are many things that this institution or any institution can do for you. There are some things, however, that it cannot do for you. And I'd just like to list a few of them. This institution, if you apply yourself properly, will provide you with entry skills into that profession or occupation which you choose. By its very nature, it cannot make you a journeyman mechanic. It cannot give you the total experience that's required on, in a job to raise you to the higher, highest standards, but it can give you the entry skill. It will provide a reasonable starting wage and an opportunity to increase those wages as you produce. It will not make you rich quick. It isn't a get rich quick program. It will provide you for an opportunity for a job entry. It will not guarantee you success. That depends on you. And the formula for success hasn't changed over the years. It is a personal matter and, and uh, you, can, you can acquire it, but the institution can't pour it on you. And finally, it will provide a sense of personal satisfaction for accomplishment and a recognition by the public of your achievement. And I think this last is, is very important because as I started out, I think there has been a great change in viewpoint and attitude on the part of the educational system as well as the community at large that there is greater respect now for vocational education and those engaged in vocational occupations. I think it, this is wonderful, and I hope that it will continue in the future. I congratulate all of you for your untiring efforts in bringing this building, this institution, to its present position. And I am proud of a small part that I may have played in this process. I express my, uh, to you my continued support for technical and vocational education in the future. Thank you very kindly, Senator. They've told me the third time is the charm. So Stan, if you would like to dial that modern gadget again, we'll see if technology comes to light.
Well, anyway, we tried. That sign, of course, as you've probably been able to discern, says technology moves on. And we're certainly hopeful that this great facility we have here will assist in that particular objective. Now, we are very, very honored this morning to have on campus Elder Robert L. Simpson, the assistant to the Council of Twelve, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who is also a member of the College Advisory Council and has been for many years. And he will dedicate this edifice for us. Elder? As we <clears throat> prepare for this <clears throat> dedicatory prayer, I would just like <clears throat> each of you to know that I am honored to represent all religious faiths of this valley. And speaking for <clears throat> all of the clergy, I want you to know that we're grateful to have such a facility in our community. And we only pray that those things that are taught here will be in harmony with truth and those things that are divinely given. I think to be educated is a divine right. And I think only those who accept it as such and, and uh, are willing to be educated within that framework can achieve the total fulfillment of education. And uh, that would be the hope that we would express here this morning. Uh, I couldn't help but be uh, gratified by the remarks of both Dr. Nelsons as they indicated the need for technology and as they indicated a uh, effort on the part of our educational systems to start young people at an earlier age along these uh, technical avenues. I was, uh, couldn't help but smile as I remembered quickly a story that I heard recently about <clears throat> three young men in kindergarten <clears throat> sitting out in the schoolyard at recess time and all of a sudden one of them looks up and says, gee fellows, look, there goes one of those neat super jets. He must going at least 600 miles per hour. And the second little fellow says, you bet he's going 600 miles an hour. And you would too if you had some of those J7 engines attached to you with a 50,000 <laughs> 50, pound thrust. And then the third little fellow said, not only that, look at those contrails, must be five miles long. That means he's up there at least 35,000 feet and the temperature's at least 40 degrees below zero. <laughs> Just then the bell rings, and the first old fellow says, come on, fellas, we got to go back and stack blocks again. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm sure that sometimes we underestimate the capacity and the ability of our upcoming youth, and I'm grateful that this facility will meet the challenge of this upcoming youth and provide them a place to receive the technical education that they seek. May we now join together and, and bow our heads as we give thanks for this tremendous blessing this morning. Our loving and eternal Father in heaven, with gratitude we bow our hearts, our heads, and combine our hearts this morning in the attitude of prayer as we convene here to thank thee for this rich blessing of a new addition to our great college. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have been able to plant these foundations in free soil. We're grateful for freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of education, with the ability to learn and to be taught, with the ability to seek truth, and the ability to build and grow together in this framework of truth and righteousness. Now, Heavenly Father, we're also grateful this morning to, to be located in this beautiful valley. We thank thee for fertile soil and for majestic mountains and for the strength that we feel in this locality. We're grateful for pioneers who have come ahead and who have establish things for us that we might enjoy that which is here. We're grateful for the great concept that was established by them as they came with skills rather than goods, as they came with faith rather than capital. And we recognize, Heavenly Father, that skill and faith are the 
things that will help us to achieve and to be able to grow and build together. And so we thank thee for many things, but how grateful we are for Utah Technical College and for our State Board of Education and for people who are mindful of the needs of our community and people who are willing to affect legislation and to cause things to happen that would provide for the needs of the future. Bless these good people, Heavenly Father, and we pray that uh, we might always be able to arrange for such good people to be in these important positions. We're grateful for the leadership of this campus, and we pray for them. We're grateful for their vision. We're grateful for their untiring efforts in causing things such as this building to happen. We're grateful, Heavenly Father, for our student body, those who have gone before, those who are in school now, those who are to come. And we pray that they might come eager to learn. We pray that uh, truth will be the foundation of all teaching here. And we pray that as young people receive truth in those things that are in the framework of technology and, and skills of our day, we pray that they might be able to learn it in such a way that they will be a benefit to mankind and find total fulfillment in their lives as they seek to bring up their families in a proper way and bring the spirit of America into their homes. Now, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful unto Thee, and we have received so much. And we pray that as we pause this hour that we might uh, dedicate ourselves that as we partake of the wonderful wells of living water that have been provided for us from those that have gone before and as we warm ourselves by these fires that have been set in place, uh, help us to think more in terms of digging new wells that others might uh, profit from our endeavors. Help us to kindle other fires that we might be able to provide conveniences for others who are even unborn. And we pray that we might always have this wonderful concept of doing for others, which of course was the great message of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Now, Heavenly Father, we bow our heads at this time to dedicate this facility. And by the authority of the priesthood that I hold, we dedicate this facility to thy holy purposes, for we recognize that inseparably is truth and education, and we recognize that all truth comes from thee, and so we dedicate this building to that purpose, the purpose for which it was conceived and created. And we pray that everyone associated with it might be able to work to this end, that many will be blessed as a result of this great edifice, that many other facilities will follow as the need is there, and that good men will see that it happens. And these blessings we pray for humbly, thanking thee for the great Thanksgiving season just passed and for all that Christmas should mean. May we cherish it. May we practice those things that would be compatible with the life and the spirit of the Savior of the world. We pray humbly in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, may we express our gratitude and appreciation to all those who has, have participated on our program today. And I certainly would like to acknowledge the many friends and colleagues uh, that have come to the campus. We're appreciative of the representatives who are here from the post high school institutions in the state of Utah. And we sincerely hope that you have enjoyed these ceremonies. I'm also grateful to the gentleman who has provided our musical prelude and will play immediately at the conclusion of the exercises, uh, Mr. Dean Almond, who is the manager of Summer Hayes Music Company. We appreciate him very much. So at this particular time, then, we will call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>